morning, everyone. Hello. There's a wee touch of the croon club going about this week, so ho hopefully you can bear with me. Uh, the voice is a wee bit, a wee bit hoarse, but um, we'll bear, we'll work with it. Uh, as we bid you welcome to church this morning, uh, some announcements. Announcement sheets are available uh, in the vestibule, but just to highlight to you that a Harvest Thanksgiving evening service is in Tumbo this evening at 6 30 pm, and you'd be very welcome to attend and to be part of that. Uh, PW meeting then is on Monday the 24th of October with Mrs. Uh, Jean Farrell. And just to say then that I'll be on holiday on this incoming week and the, the guest speaker uh, next Sunday will be Mr. Tom Saunderson uh, and there will be no midweek um, prayer meeting and Bible study on Wednesday night. And then just uh, the way it works out, the following Sunday the 30th of October uh, I will be speaking in on Gun Presbyterian Church, and the speaker here will be Mr. Uh, Joseph Kennelly. Uh, and the following Sunday, the first Sunday in November, will be Communion Sunday, so just uh, to let you plan and prepare for that. As we come to worship this morning, our uh, words, our thoughts uh, are taken and drawn from Psalm, Psalm 16. It says, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in peace. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Let's come before God in prayer. Let's pray. Father God, as we draw aside in the place of worship this day, my Father, we come with the, the contentment within us that you are the living and that you are the true God and that by your Spirit you come to meet with us. And so, Lord God, as we gather this day, we pray that you would prepare our hearts, that we would turn our focus, our gaze, our thoughts, our concentration, our mind and our time towards you so that we too may know not only your presence with us, but we may know your message for us. We may understand your teaching and that we may be guided by your wisdom this day and in the days that lie ahead. So Father, as we bow before you, we realize that we have sinned. And so we repent of those sins and ask that by your grace and mercy you would forgive us and that you would cleanse us and make us whole in your sight. Lord, we come and we commit our time and all that we say and do into your hands. And as we do that, Lord God, we pray that our worship here would bring glory to you, that it would help us to grow and to be strengthened in our faith, and in so doing, to serve you better. These things we pray in our Saviour's name. Amen. Let's open up our handbooks as we turn to hit number 669 to sing the words if i come to jesus he will make me glad <laughs>
today in our service where we're going to be thinking about the question, aren't Christians killjoys? And we want to discover and to remind ourselves about where our joy lies and where our joy is found within the Christian faith. So just as we've been singing there, that Jesus will make us glad, we, we want to come uh, as we share time with the boys and girls and young people to think about something that can take away our joy. It doesn't matter what age we are, who we are, it's something that can take our joy away. And to learn about this and to think about it, uh, I have a couple of wee stories uh, to share this morning. One of them was to do with uh, a family and the daddy was called Tim. And one morning Tim came down to breakfast and he was sitting at the breakfast table and he was eating his cornflakes and he was just sort of paddling through them. He was just flicking them about and he wasn't really concentrating. And, and mommy knew there was something wrong and she says, what's wrong? Well, why are you not eating your breakfast? Why are you so sad looking today? <coughs> and Tim said, I'm sad this morning because I'm worrying about a job interview I have this afternoon. I applied for a job and worked to get a promotion so that we'd have more money. And I'm worried about it. I'm worried that it won't go that well. And you know this, I'm not worried about it. I couldn't sleep that well last night. Boys and girls, do you, do you know what worry is or how would you describe worry? And it's really whenever we let someone or something take hold on us. It's a, it's a fear that we let into our lives. And we think that much about it, but we don't have time to think about anything else. And so that fear then becomes a worry, and we become obsessed, or we become focused on it. And there are times that worry can make us not only sad, but if we worry too much, it can make us sick. It can be like Tim, we, we, we don't eat properly, and what we eat doesn't taste very good. So if I asked you this morning, boys and girls, do you have any worries? You don't have to answer, you don't have to put up any hands, but do you have things that worry you? A couple of weeks ago, I had something that worried me at least slightly. I had lost my wallet and I couldn't find it. I didn't know where I'd set it. I didn't know if I'd been out walking for, uh, going for a walk along the river, if it fell out of my pocket or fell into the river. I didn't know if I had left it behind in another meeting or in somebody's house. And so I was scratching my head and worrying a wee bit during the week, or for a week, about where this was. Uh, and then eventually I started to ring the bank to, to cancel my cards so that I wouldn't have to worry about someone else getting the cards and using them. So, so worries can affect the minister or older people, not just boys and girls and young people. And I was thinking, boys and girls, about how we can pass on worry. Now, if you've got something in life that, that's troubling you, that at school it might be exams, you might be tests, or it might be somebody that, that's sadly bullying, we just don't know but how, how, can we, how can we deal with our worries? Well, one, one way we could address it if you, if you imagine you've, you've got a ball or a ball of wood or something, something around and you think of this as being your worry and, and it's something that you're holding on to, you're afraid of, it's a fear and, and you're thinking about it and you're obsessed about it. But one of the ways, one of the ways that we can take our focus, we can help to pass it on, is to throw it away, to throw it, throw it away, to give it to someone else so that we don't have it. It's not near our heart, it's not in our hands, we have passed it on. 
And that's what the Bible tells us to do with our worries. And that, that maybe, whenever you're worrying, might sign, sound very simple. How can I throw my worry away? How can I pass it on? Well, Jesus tells us that he will take our worries, that we are to cast our cares, that we are to cast our worries, to cast our burdens on him. We are to throw them over to him. And how we do that is we tell Jesus about them. We pray to him about the things that trouble us. And so we can tell him that it's a test or an exam. We can tell him that someone's annoying us and share it with him. We can also tell a grown up or an adult or tell your teacher <coughs> what your worry or what your concern is. Because the truth of the matter is, boys and girls, not only does Jesus want to help, but so do grown ups and adults. They want to help you overcome or to deal with the things that trouble you, the things that worry you. And so it's important to be able to let go of things. Even as adults, it's important to be able to pass things on. And there's another story, uh, and it's to do with a man that had troubles. And he carried them on his back like a bag of potatoes. And if you can just imagine, this, this man had his worries, his troubles on his shoulder. And he was walking along a road. Say he's walking along a road from Town to Tullamore. Uh, and the man was not walking along and he was carrying these troubles. And John was driving along with the tractor and the trailer. And he said, you can stop and I'll give your man a lift. Sure, there's no point in carrying all them potatoes to Tullamore where he's going. So John stopped and, and says, get on there and take a lift. Uh, and sit in the trailer. So the man got onto the trailer and he sat in the trailer. He was still carrying the bag of potatoes to the ship. And they were driving on down the road and John looked around to see that he was still in the trailer and he's still okay. And he's seen the boy with a bag of potatoes still on his shoulder. And then he pulled the tractor and he says, he says, what are you carrying the bag of potatoes on your shoulder for? He says, could you not set them down in the trailer? And the man says, no, the, the trailer is a big enough load to, to carry without me setting the potatoes on. He just hadn't captured that. He could set the potatoes down. And so sometimes it's like us in prayer, we think that we can't pass things on to God, that God's not big enough to be able to carry everybody's worries. But God says, cast your cares, your burdens, your worries on me, and I will take care of them. So remember, don't, don't hold on to them. Another way, another way thing maybe would help us at night just to get rid of our worries. Maybe you've got a, a bag or a bin or a box or something. And if there's something that's worrying you, you can take a piece of paper and write on it the thing that's worrying you. And then crumple it up and throw it into the bin. And then pray to God about it. And go to sleep. We're not meant to carry those burdens, those weights. Yes, we have to think about them, we have to deal with them, but we're to involve God and to share them with Him, and He will help us to carry our burdens, and He will help us to deal with them. Let's open up our hymn books, and we're going to turn to Mission Praise 439. Lord of all being, thrown to fire, Thy glory flames from the sun and star. <laughs>
Lord Bibles at Psalm 27 on page 557 of the Pew Bibles. That's page 557. As we read uh, Psalm 1, beginning with the first verse, and we read the whole Psalm. Psalm 27. <clears throat> the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, that is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his tabernacle will I sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, O Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, O God, my Savior. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not hand me over to the desire of my foes. For false witnesses rise up against me, breathing out violence. I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart. And wait for the Lord. And may he be pleased to bless the three names of the Lord. Let's turn to our God in prayer. Let's pray. Father God, as we bow again in the Holy Presence in the attitude of prayer, Lord God, we come to you with thankfulness. Father, our hearts are thankful for what you've done and are doing for us. And yet, Lord, there are times when we can struggle to, to utter words of thanks. Lord, today we thank you for our offering. We thank you for the blessings that you've given to us and how we are able to give back to you. Lord, not only for that, but we're thankful for the health and for the strength that you have given to us in our body and in our mind. Lord, we thank you for the joy that we have of knowing you. And so we're mindful of our contentment, our gladness, the joy that you have placed within us. We thank you, Lord God, that we can share our worries, we can hand our worries and fears across to you because you call on us to cast our burdens on you. And so, Lord God, as we follow through in that today, we, we pray, we pray as we understand you have made us all with our different emotions and how our emotions, Lord, are to be in balance. You created us with a need for a deep, lasting joy and contentment that only you can give. Lord, anything else that comes from a world is shallow and fleeting and does not last. And so today, Lord God, we pray for those that are inclined toward it. We pray, Lord, that they may be able to cast their cares and burdens upon you. We pray, Lord, today for those who do not have the joy of the Lord. We pray, Lord, that they may again seek your face, that they may be encouraged in their faith. And Lord, that as they're aware of your nearness with them, that their joy may be restored and increased as they belong with you. Father, we pray this morning for our people in our world who are carrying heavy loads, whether at work, or at home. We pray, Father, that you would be 
pleased to grant to them strength, wisdom and faith to deal with the things that trouble them. But Lord, so often we know from our own experience that when things trouble us and worry us, they are indeed a major sense or a major source of energy and fear. And Lord, how indeed we can lose joy as we focus on the things that trouble us. Lord, to others they may look small and insignificant, and yet to us they seem to grow and grow. So, Father, for those today that have fears, worries, and concerns, we pray for your hand to be upon them and your care to be near to them. Lord God, as we pray for wisdom in all these things, we pray to you for our Kirk session for our church committee and ask that you would grant them wisdom that you would grant them guidance and direction in all of the matters that they deal with. And so we pray these things this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's open up our hymn books as this time we turn to Mission Praise 624 to sing the words of the hymn, Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to me. Negatives, 
A Christian who is someone who doesn't do A, B, or C, or X, Y, or Z. They think in terms of thou shalt not. Therefore, one of the reasons that people sometimes give for not being Christians is that they feel that this Christian faith, this Christianity, would be restrictive to them and to the life that they want to live. There would be too many things that they would have to give up. And some people think this way and say that they hope to become a Christian at some point in the future, some time after they've had their fun first. Is that what some folk think, isn't it? Have your fun and then whenever you're sort of running out of energy and you're running out of options, and then maybe you can think about this, this Christian faith, this Christian identity. Uh, and yet we should stop there and say that Jesus, Jesus most certainly is not about limiting joy, much less about killing our joy. He wants to maximize joy in your life and in mine. On one occasion the Bible just said, I am coming to you now. But I say these things while I'm still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. He was speaking to his heavenly father, and he was talking about his disciples, his followers. And he makes it clear that he wants them to have joy. In fact, as he says, he wants them to have the full measure of his joy. Jesus wants to maximize joy in our lives. And so I suppose at the outset, we, we want to deal with this criticism of Christianity relating to the matter of joy. And then, as we deal with that, then we move on to look at what Christianity claims about joy. The criticism. There are many criticisms that are leveled at the Christian faith, but whenever it comes to joy, people often criticize, they're critical of Christianity because they think it's restrictive, they think that it is limiting, that it imposes boundaries upon them. And the simple answer is yes, there are restrictions in Christianity. If you're going to follow Jesus Christ, it means acknowledging that he has the right to tell you what is right and what is wrong. And there are some things, there's some things in life that are incompatible with following Jesus. And they are the things that need to be pruned or they need to be cut out of our lives. But what can we say about Christianity and restrictions. And to some degree, whenever we think about restrictions, we all, in some form or other, accept that there are restrictions on the way that we live our lives. We, we've got in the workplace different policy documents, different pieces of law. We've got to, in the church, policies and our child protection or taking care, how we care for young people and vulnerable adults alike. We've got the workplace health and safety and in our law in our land we have laws, we have speed limits, many different things whereby they place restrictions upon us. But as we can understand restrictions placed upon us for our good and the good of society. So restrictions are there, but there will be some people you will meet uh, and they will say, well, I think, I think it's up to the individual to decide what's right and what's wrong. And nobody else is going to tell me what to do. I think the individual, I think I can decide for myself. But yet we all, even the most committed person that you can think of, if you go back to them and say, is that right? 
they will come to a point where they will decide that something is right and something is wrong. Even the person who thinks that you should decide for yourself what to do, they in their own mind will eventually come to restrictions that they will put. They will say, no, but that's not right, or people shouldn't do that. Uh, and so it would be interesting if, if you know someone that uh, follows that line of argument, everybody should be able to do what they want to do. Go back and, and discuss that and see how far they, they go before they eventually say, well, no, I don't think people should do that, or I think it's wrong to do that. And so in ourselves, we have this idea of right and wrong. We have an idea about a sense of restrictions. Because we all will acknowledge at some point that there are the standards of right and wrong. Right and wrong that ought to be imposed upon others, even if we don't necessarily agree what those restrictions are. So, pursuing one thing means restrictions. As we said, sometimes people suggest that freedom should be about having nothing out of minds. We can do whatever we want. But usually a commitment to a particular path does make things out of bounds. For example, if if I wanted to take up running in preparation for the next Commonwealth Games, you know, I'd have to make changes, wouldn't I? I'd have to change my diet, I'd have to change my routine. There are things I'd have to do away with chips. There would be restrictions on my diet so that my nutrient level, my intake would be right. Pursuing a particular path means embracing restrictions. And so we shouldn't, we shouldn't be surprised, therefore, like, that when we embrace Christ as our Lord and Saviour, that there are restrictions that come with it. And yet, no, we're to see that restrictions are not necessarily negative. We're to see that the restrictions that come in following Jesus are good. If we accept that we need to have boundaries from somewhere, and that everyone making up their own boundaries is a mess. Who do we turn to? Where do we turn to? Well, wouldn't it be great if there was someone who had the big picture who could see, who could see the whole thing before them, who was really interested in our best and our joy, and they could come up with the boundaries and set them for us, because we have struggled as human beings to do it. And that is exactly what Christianity claims. It claims that God is the one who sees the big picture. God is the one who loves us and cares for us and wants us to have joy. And it's God who has set the correct boundaries in place. Think of the Ten Commandments. He says, don't murder. He says, don't steal. He says, be faithful to your spouse. He knows that all these are good things. They are boundaries, certainly, but they are good boundaries. There are benefits with them. And without doubt, they cut across what we often want to do. But that's an indication of God's care for us. Not of Him being out to spoil our fun, to kill our joy. If you're a parent, and you've been in that situation where you've been saying, I've had to say to your child or your children, I don't want you to do this. I know you're going to disagree with me, but I know that it's not in your best interest to be able to do that. We have to draw a line, we have to set boundaries. That's not appropriate behaviour. That's not the right thing to do. And so the parent is drawing boundaries out of love for the welfare of their child or children. And Jesus draws lines or boundaries for our good because we by faith are his children. So to criticise Christianity for being restrictive is perhaps understandable. But we need to remember that we all draw boundaries and we need to remember
remember that the boundaries can be seen in a positive light and that God's boundaries have been drawn for our good, whether individually or whether collectively. So what does, what does Christianity have to say about John? As I, I said earlier, God's intention for us is that our joy is maximised. And yet, though, I suppose we need to clarify that joy is not the same as having fun. Joy is something much deeper. Joy is to do with a happiness and a contentment of the heart. There's many things where we enjoy and it's a bit of fun, but it lasts for a moment, a day or a night, and it's over. It's happened and gone. And joy is a peace and a contentment in our heart. And therefore that peace and contentment is in our heart, irrespective of the mood, or irrespective of what we're going through at that particular time. We know that underneath everything, we've got this joy from our faith, from our God. So, we could then move on in Scripture to look at three people. We could look at someone who found their joy. We could look at someone who couldn't lose their joy and someone who gave up their joy. So, there was a woman who found joy. That was the woman at the well in Samaria. Jesus uh, encountered the woman at the well in Samaria. Uh, if, you, if you think about that story or reread it, you'll discover uh, she had a fairly, a fairly tough life. She'd been in and out of loads of relationships uh, and it looks like she's been bruised by them all in some shape or form. And now, graciously, she was getting on a bit in years. She probably realised that the relationship she was in wasn't going that well either. It didn't offer much hope for the future. So she got into conversation with this man, Jesus, at the well. And Jesus knew her. And Jesus spoke to her about a springing of living water. And that really got her attention because she knew that he was speaking not just about the water and the well, but he was speaking about something that was spiritual. And she knew in her own heart of hearts that that was something that she was lacking. She was lacking a spiritual understanding, a spiritual relationship. She'd been looking for joy. She'd been looking for satisfaction from other things and most especially in her relationships. But Jesus was now taking time to speak to her about internal satisfaction. Joy that would bubble up from within. And there's lovely detail in that story that we can often overlook. That when the woman came to the well, the Bible tells us that she was carrying a water jar. And the detail there seems to be the hint to the fact that her life was empty. The water jar was empty. She was coming to the well to get filled. Her life was empty. She was coming to the well to have it filled, coming to Jesus. The water jar could be temporarily filled, but soon it could be empty again. Relationships maybe brought some joy, but then her life was empty again. She knew joy, but it didn't last. But towards the end of that story of the woman meeting Jesus at the well, the woman who brought her empty water jar, we're told that she left her water jar with Jesus. And so it's indicating to us that she found the spring of living water. She found faith in Jesus. She was done with temporary joys. She had found real satisfaction, real satisfying, bubbling up joy through meeting Jesus and coming to the world. You see, amazingly, that the Bible tells us that we were made for it. God's purpose in making us was allowing us to have joy. Short of catechism, it's the 
designed to be used to teach people and the basics of the Christian faith. And it starts off with question one, what is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Now, the writers of the Catechism, they knew something when they said this. They said, joy is what we are here for. It's not a bonus that if we're nice and then we have. It's what we are made for. It's what God designed us for. And of course, and these leaders got right when they made clear that it comes from the Lord God. And Psalm 16 says, Thou wilt show me the path of life. And at its end, it says, In thy presence is full of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. And so we're to see this morning that joy is all wrapped up with knowing we were made for joy, and that joy comes from being in a relationship with the living God. And yet, we know that as we look out on our world, it is so rare for people to find that joy that bubbles up within them. There are so many people in our world that they are searching for joy. And that shows us that something has gone wrong. I was listening to the news during the week uh, about uh, the inquest had opened for a young girl from Antiaramal. Uh, her mum had dropped her off at university and within, within 48 hours her daughter was dead. And that, that is painful, that, that's sad. And as I thought about that and about working within the quest, they were saying that they found they found a mix of alcohol and, and drugs. And however that got there, that's no doubt something that they are investigating and looking at. But within the company of that young girl, certainly alcohol and drugs must have existed. And isn't it sad? Or at least, as I thought about it, I thought, isn't this sad? Here's intellectually bright young people with the world before them. Uh, and to try and find joy and find some excitement. Drink or drugs have to be involved. And I, I do personally, I find it sad that people in life ignore and can't see the joy that is offered by our God that people go seeking just as a woman in this story she went seeking her joy in relationships and there are many people who do that today as well there are many who seek their joy in different ways but that does not last our world is seeking for joy so how do we present to them the joy that only God as a world, we are fallen, we have turned away from God's original intention. We have decided to go our own way. We are the ones who have decided to reject God. We tend to say, I don't want you to be my God. And if you want to check that out, ask yourself a question. Who is the right to tell me what to do? Isn't that how people respond? And that's a symptom of our desire for independence from God. God is the one who offers us joy in the capital J. Are we going to are we going to overlook that joy of the capital J for small joys that we think this world has to offer? So often we can be guilty of being joy substitutors. We seek joy, we crave joy, we crave happiness of heart. But we go looking for it in the wrong places. We think that little joys will all add up to bring us great joy. For the woman at the well, it looked as if she was someone who had been seeking joy through relationships, through the love of others, and clearly it wasn't working. It was a reflection, a sign that she was searching deeper. 
She had a deeper need than that joy on the surface. She had the need for the joy that only God can give. Joy is found in Jesus. A, a person or a man who, who couldn't lose his joy. And we want to think briefly about the Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul, he wrote a letter to the church at Philippi. Uh, and it's a letter that is full of joy and we say that's great. Uh, 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 we all want to hear the good news, the joy. And as you read through that letter of uh, Philippians, it's relatively short. It's full of references about joy and about rejoicing. It's all to encourage the Christians to know and to find the joy of Jesus Christ. And as you read it, you get a picture that without doubt Paul knew what it was to have joy. He had a real happiness of heart that it was bubbling through from this joy that was deep within. And yet, the remarkable thing is that as you read this letter, you may have forgotten the very fact that Paul writing this letter filled with the words of joy and of rejoicing was in prison. How, how could Paul rejoice? How would we rejoice if we were in a cell, if we were in jail? All the circumstances are not happy. Paul says he's in chains. Paul says he's awaiting the trial. Paul says there's a strong possibility that he's going to be executed. So basically, in American terms, we have a prisoner who's here on death row and he's writing about joy. And Paul says, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Does that take us back to what we were discussing with the boys and girls about the worries, the fears, the concerns? We are called to learn to be content with whatever the circumstances. There are days, there are weeks, and there are times when that's difficult. It's not always easy. But that's what the Christian is to do, to be content because they have this joy that is deep down within them to draw from. How, how could Paul write that to other people? Was he not being hypocritical, talking about joy and rejoicing? No, he wasn't. He was being faithful and true because the joy that Jesus gives cannot be taken away. Even death cannot be in Psalm 16 again says, You fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Paul had that to look forward to, that place in heaven at the right hand in the presence of God. Jesus gives us a joy. It's a joy that can't be taken from us, it's a joy that's everlasting. If we find joy in our relationships, in our family, in our careers, in our sport, well, at some point we're going to lose it. We're not going to be able to play the sport as well as we once did. Our family relationships are going to change as we grow older and as people die. Our career, no matter how good it is, someday we retire and take our retirement. Someday, there's a, a, a retired minister rang me up the other day, and, and he says, he says, Trevor, he says, I'm a husband. Uh, he says, um, I'm retired that long. Uh, so, people, depending on their careers, on their, on their relationships, on their sport, they may give a kick and encouragement and joy at that time, but it doesn't last. Everything we look to will eventually lose. But Jesus gives us a joy that can't be taken from us. And thirdly, someone who gave up their joy. If we take what the Bible says seriously, Jesus was the most joyful person who ever lived. That 
doesn't mean that they don't have to be there. But he was full of joy. And if we think about what about it, it makes sense. Because if joy comes from knowing God, then his relationship with his heavenly father was perfect and therefore he knew the fullness of joy. But then if we go to that moving scene of the age of the death of Jesus, where Jesus took his disciples into the Garden of Gethsemane outside Jerusalem, and they went there to pray. And Jesus said, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And he said to the disciples, Stay here and keep watch. And going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. And then shortly after that, Jesus was arrested. Shortly after that, he was tried. Shortly after that, he was crucified. What is it that caused Jesus so much anguish? It's what he knows is going to happen, happen on that cross at Calvary. On the cross, he knows that he will have to bear the weight of human sin. He will take it and take God's punishment upon him. In ways we can't understand, he was cut off from his heavenly power as he paid that price and bore that punishment. He knew what it is was to give up his joy for that point in time. He did that for you and for me so that we could have full joy. So, in closing, are Christians killing joys? Maybe in the past, some of us have been, some of us are. But we should be, because Jesus Christ is interested in maximizing your joy and my joy. That real, bubbling, everlasting joy that can't be taken away. And so keen was he to give that gift to us that he laid down his joy, laid down his life, so that we could share his joy, true everlasting joy that only he could give it to us. May that be your portion today. Let's pray. Father God, we stop and thank you for our lives, Lord, we thank you that you have created us in your image and that you understand our emotions, you understand our characteristics, our DNA, the things that make us who we are and the things that set us apart from others. Lord God, we pray that for each of us we may know the full portion of your joy through trusting and depending upon you and you alone. Lord, help us to understand that the Christian faith is not about killing joy, but rather the Christian faith is to bring joy. Turning to the words of the closing hymn, it's Mission Praise 765, as we sing, Who can cheer the heart like Jesus by his presence all divine?
hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God the Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And now may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore.